I'm Rora. I'm Jane. And we are Birds of Clay. And we're here to talk all things Australian pottery and ceramic art. So put your kettle on. And let's have a chat. like to pay our respects to the traditional custodians on the lands on which this podcast is recorded. We acknowledge the rich history of art, craft and storytelling that has been occurring for millennia and acknowledge elders past, present and country as provider, protector and guide. Working with clay is intrinsically linked to country and we would not be here without the care and connection that our First Nations peoples have shown for thousands of years on this continent we call Australia. Hi everyone, it's Jane here. Just checking in before our interview to say that we're going to be taking a short break. We will be back in August with a short series focusing on creative arts and well-being, um, which I'm really excited about. As those who have been listening know, um, that's the focus area of my degree. So yeah, I'm going to be interviewing some really interesting people and talking about um, how to look after ourselves, which should be great. Um, And then after that, we'll be back to our usual chats and interviews. Um, There's a bit going on in both of our lives at the moment. And yeah, we're excited to see where this all goes. Um, Thanks everyone for listening. And yeah, hope you enjoy this interview. Hey everybody. Hey Jane. Hey Rora. Hey Rachel. (laughs) Hi Rachel. (laughs) Today we have Rachel North joining us. It's so good to finally have you here. Thank you. That's okay. <laughs> What's been happening? Um, just actually having a bit of a rest from a couple of, like a busy couple of months, um, 12 months really. So yeah. having some downtime. Nice. Just had two week break of not making anything. So That is so good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and doesn't happen often. No. <laughs> um, so for those listening, Rachel is someone Jane and I know through uni. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> as have all our guests been pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah, so Rachel, you are you've returned to uni, so it's a yeah. you started before and now you're yeah. Back. So I this is my second degree, and so when I finished school, I obviously studied to be a, a teacher, a high school teacher, and um, probably about ten years ago, maybe twelve years ago, I started and went back and started doing my bachelor of fine arts so that I could teach high school visual arts because that's where my passion was. Um, and so my initial literature degree was like my backup plan mm. because uh, I just didn't feel that my portfolio coming out of high school was strong enough to get into QCA, which is where I wanted to study visual arts. And so, you know, I loved literature just as much and that's the path that I went down. And then I did lots of traveling to Europe and, you know, overseas and it just felt like that love of mine because I was constantly creating when I was a a teenager and a child and even while I was at uni I I would gift paintings to people I would make art and gift those and I was still always drawing Um, it felt like that was missing Mm -hmm. and because I was living in the countryside and working in um, a rural regional area it it just yeah it felt like it was missing and so I took that opportunity as things were starting to sort of open up with online studying um, to go back and, and study my fine arts degree. <laughs> and then um, there were very few places that actually offered any kind of online uh, visual arts, um, tertiary sort of courses and things. So I was very limited. And then when I moved down to Southeast Queensland 10 years ago, I, um, I was teaching in the subject area. So it was all really, and I think I had maybe like a year left in my course because I was studying part time and I just realized I didn't need to finish it to be doing what I was doing. Like I got a promotion. I was working in the space. I, you know, working. And that's not to diminish the value of of those um, courses in that sphere um, because it is quite important. But, um, you know, I think when you're quite academically inclined and really passionate about what you do, you take the knowledge that you have and you take the experience that you have and you do that. And Mm. so um, I just didn't, you know, I was doing some exhibition work. I did a couple of group shows and then I got a promotion and that's kind of where 
my sort of tertiary training paused. Um, did it feel like an unnecessary extra pressure at the time too? It did because I didn't have the time to be working at the level that I wanted to be. And so in that same way, my that's when my practice shifted a little bit as well because I didn't because I was working in sort of leadership, I didn't have that extra time that you have to really devote to your artistic practice and I'd done those couple of shows and so anyone who looks at my artist CV will see this big gap and that's where I was pursuing my other passion which was you know educating students from um, you know disadvantaged backgrounds low socioeconomic schools like I've never worked in privileged schools I've had plenty of people tell me you know I would be easily um, highly employed in the private sector and I'm like that's not me mm. like I grew up quite poor I'm gonna say poor like we grew up poor um you know the the biggest asset we had was the the property that my parents lived on um and so I for me education was an escape from that that small town cycle of you know welfare dependency living really you know tough from paycheck to paycheck it allowed me to sort of see the world and that's where art kind of always featured in my life like art opened my eyes to the possibilities of the world and I think it's really difficult when you are a person who is really engaged in sort of social I'm not going to say social justice but the an understanding of of society and why society behaves the way that it does um like current issues yeah, yeah yeah and so growing up in a small town community where it's still very closed minded um you know it was really difficult and i i had a lot of um conflict with um people including my parents about ideologies around discrimination and opportunity and equality racism you know i grew up on um the athenan tablelands which has a really large and rich um you know first nations culture and I, yeah, I saw quite early on how that disadvantage played out in the opportunities that were available to people in, in that. And so art, you know, and I had some really good high school art teachers who showed me the artists and, and you know, I learnt about people like George O'Keefe and Frida Kahlo and they really stand out because of, in particular Frida Kahlo, because of the way that her work um, allowed her to express things that were singular to her life but also a greater representation of of women's roles in society at the time um and the opportunities available as well and i find georgia o'keefe really interesting and this is why i always teach her when i do um design programs is that her i guess her sort of like step into the art world was essentially a result of her partner taking advantage of um you know photographic documentation from an intimate relationship and presenting that to the world as art and speaking on her behalf and essentially her conceptual narrative was always colored by the narrative that he presented because he had a role and a, a position in artistic society and social that, power yeah. yeah and so it was his and so those are all the things that I found really interesting and you know so when of course I I never wanted to sort of stay in that small town and so university for me was always about going down to the southeast corner I didn't want to go to Townsville Townsville didn't have a didn't have the courses and, and b you know was much of the same really <laughs> um and so you know, my the people that I met when I was doing my literature degree and my history degree, like those are some of my favourite people. And even though I'm not sort of close to them um, as much anymore, like those conversations and those connections were so valuable, I guess, in developing my understanding of the world and my ability to sort of communicate my ideas um, and that I think is reflected in in the work that I make and the approach to to art that I take. 
Yeah, you definitely, you do have a really, uh, the way your ideas come across, it's really strong. And yeah. you're multidis- multidisciplinary too. Mm. So painting, textiles, ceramics. Yeah. What came first? I think you mentioned you were painting. Yeah. So when on. I studied my fine arts first time around, I was a painting major because I loved painting. Like there was, <coughs> and I think that comes from, sort of this discourse around painting being the original fine art media and so when you grow up in that sort of that time that I was growing up and you're growing up in a small town and you're sort of even learning tertiary from in a small regional town like Toowoomba was not was not the big smoke <laughs> it was like a you know a big country town um, when I was studying and so access to those conceptual ideas and that conceptual understanding of what art could be um, and when I was first started studying my fine arts, I was living in a, a regional town. Um, and so my access to, you know, what is art? How, how do we communicate best through art? You know, I was still at that time operating under that veil of, you know, painting is the fine art Just medium. Very traditional. Yeah, yeah. That traditional, that traditional understanding of what art is. And, and that comes back to who the artistic influences were in my life, like Frida Kahlo, painter, George O'Keefe painter, John Olson painter, mm-hmm. like, um, you know, those people. I, I didn't like pop art. I didn't like, mm-hmm. you know, all that kind of conceptual dataism. Let's put a toilet on a, on a wooden stool. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm so, like, I understand, like, I understand the purpose, like, of dataism. I understand yeah. what Deschamps was about there. But, you know, my preference for Deschamps' work is, you know, um, girl walking down a staircase or girl with a mandolin like those are his beautiful cubist works um and so i loved the way that that and the way that painting as a medium could express that um you know but painting is a very very popular art form and there's lots of people have lots of opinions about what makes a quality painting what makes a a quality conceptual and when you are when I was a young artist at that time you know I wanted to convey an idea and painting for me you know was only taking me so far and so in my first kind of group show that I did in the valley I did a series of large-scale multi-panel watercolor pieces and so I had these these walls covered in small pieces of individually painted watercolour paper and they a variety of circles and squares because I wanted to look at the way an idea could be fragmented but also presented as one. And, you know, of course, watercolour at that time, like, oh, a watercolour painting's not, you know, high art. <laughs> um, and so there's all these opinions in the art world, right? And when you're a young artist, you're impressionable by them. And when I'm saying young artist, you know, I was in my late 20s, early 30s. But at the same time, when you're new to something, doesn't matter how old you are, you're listening to feedback, you're listening to critique, you're listening to what is the, the voice of, you know, artistic discourse at the time. And it wasn't until I took the time to know myself better and to, I guess, examine who I was as a person and what was important to me that I think I started finding my voice. Mm. When did textiles come into it for you? So this is is what brought me back to art. So that time where I was working, um, you know, in leadership and, and, you know, managing an arts faculty, um, I... I like I, I, there was something missing in my life right and as a as a young person I'd grown up in the landscape in country like in the earth and I think you get to a certain point in your life where you realize that those are the things that are important to your sort of spiritual health and the textiles was a way of me working with fire, like with natural fibers in a way that I could manage in my two bedroom flat in Northgate. So, you know, I had a small space. I was on a tight budget like these. I didn't have the space to have a big painting studio. I didn't have, you know, I couldn't afford all the materials. You know, rent was ridiculous. Even at that time, you know, you're a single person paying your own way um, and trying to sort of recover from having to, you know, move from a shared sort of living situation to a single living situation. And so 
it was therapeutic for me to, you know, start. So I started by, um, I think I went to a botanical dyeing um, just workshop. It was fun. I was like, oh, silk, love silk. Um, <laughs> I love natural materials. I love natural colors. And so in my head, I was like, oh, here's nature, right? So I don't like synthetic stuff. I don't like synthetic color. Like, don't get me wrong. I love cobalt, but like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> until I discovered yeah. that indigo was the color I was searching for, um, you know, that, na- that stepping into that natural dyeing was what sort of stepped me off on that. And so initially I was just working with, you know, wool fibers, doing some natural dyeing in my kitchen, in my two bedroom flat with an era on my lovely balcony with all my plants and, you know, having those fibers sort of, and just enjoying that. And then I got into weaving because I was like, well, I'm making this color palette. How can I use this color palette to communicate what I want to say? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and at that time, you know, I'd been teaching for, what was it, like 10 years or something. And I was like, at that burnout period of being a teacher going, oh, do I want to do this forever or do I want to? So you dip your toe in going, well, how can I make my artistic practice support me? And so you start doing that. And so that's where I got into making um, like these beautiful sort of naturally dyed art yarns and spinning those and using and you know selling materials for people to use in their own oh, cool. weaving and so that's when you know weaving had a big um, resurgence so about 2018 like that that pre-2020 sort of period where weaving was really and so I got myself a couple of looms and I was making these beautiful like woven scarves a couple of looms yeah I don't even have <laughs> I don't even have the looms that I had anymore. So I've sold the ones that I started out at. Um, And and then, um, yeah, just experimenting with making these beautiful, like, botanically and natural fibre woven, like, scarves and things. And I still have them. Like, they're still hanging over my massive loom that now sits in my um, dining room. Yeah, for the context of those listening, um, the first time I went to Rachel's house, I was like, oh, it's so lovely, so curated, so natural colours and fibres and textures. And I walk into your kitchen and instead of a dining room table, you've got this loom that's like floor to ceiling, gigantic. It was, it's beautiful. Yeah. So it's a eight shaft Swedish floor loom, like countermarsh. Um, Yeah. So it's a beautiful big piece and I'm, I think the third owner. And um, yeah, it's where do a, you find a loo marketplace? Yeah, actually, oh, really? yeah. <laughs> um, and so, and that's how I made like a lovely connection with a, another textile artist who who work, who lives out in um, Mama Creek, and you know, bought my loom off her, and and she was a fantastic mentor for me. Um, and yeah, just quality sort of learning about it as a craft, and I think the tactility of textiles, and the the making the color and the sort of curating your fiber choices so to be as least processed as possible so even things like viscoses right so bamboos they're all a rayon so they all go through like a chemical process to be created superwash i never used superwash for that same reason because there's a chemical process that that natural fiber goes through to allow people to make things that they can just chuck in the washing machine because you know everything is so much about like a hustle kind of mentality at the moment like nobody's got time to hand wash a jumper Mm -hmm. um but you know i i was so because of i guess the connection between nature the landscape and what made me happy um what spoke to i guess my soul and my spirituality with the landscape was that i didn't want to be introducing any more chemicals into what i was creating than was necessary for it to be a viable product. So, you know, even when I was, you know, wet um, washing, you know, woven items, which is all part of the process, like I use natural soaps um, because, and, and I minimize the number of times I wash them because of course water usage in the textiles industry is a huge sustainability issue. Um, but any waters that I used, right, they went back into my garden or they go back into my landscape and the environment. And even now when I'm, you know, I've moved more into felting now than I have into weaving, um, just because of, I guess, yeah, the efficiency at which I can, I guess, produce 
an idea that I've got is and the, the ability to layer and have a variety of textures it takes significantly longer to do that in a woven format um, than in a felted format and I just really liked the idea of sort of working it with my hands like the the working the the soap and the water into the fibers to create that it just felt a little bit more I guess um, I don't know there was a greater sort of connectedness to what I was making when I was doing that and even though there's that same connectedness when you are using like a shafted loom or a you know hand woven frame loom um, I got a bit bored of just sitting all the time like mm. you know I was making these beautiful pieces but I was like you know listening to things in the background and doing that at the same time um, but you know I've always been quite connected to water and I think that's where you know the the like the felting sort of really fits in but also the dyeing it's that like chemistry of color mm. and the chemistry of what colors work well together and that's the really good thing about natural colors as well is that all natural colors complement each other because they are all meant to be seen beside each other because that's nature right yeah i know that makes so <laughs> sense and so that's why when you see things that are natural colors and colors from nature you, nothing kind of looks really garish and horrendous because mm. they're supposed to be seen beside each other. And and this is where I get back to cobalt, right? Cobalt and emerald and those really beautiful colours, they're based off gemstones. And whilst they're a synthetic chemical composition of those, there's still something that attracts us to those vibrant sort of colours, like when you see light through a sapphire or you see light through an emerald or mm. bouncing off, you know, a turquoise or something um you know it's it's nice yummy it's nice it's, no, There's something nice. really like <laughs> lovely about it yeah 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 wow that's very interesting <laughs> rachel i know <laughs> you've got quite the journey yeah um, so how long have you been teaching now Ooh, um i think this is my 16th year of teaching congrats yeah i know when did clay come into the picture for you have you always kind of done a bit of a bit of it with your students and yeah I think so um and so I I guess I played a lot with clay as a child growing up because um where we lived there was this lovely spring so a, a ground spring and as you know as I grew up the spring and the cyclones and everything wore away more of the the landscape where that spring fed through and so what we had was over time um, this beautiful sort of natural clay in the in the bank got exposed and so like I didn't know at the time that this was clay but I'd be down there and I'd be you know splashing around in the, and this is this is river right like this mm. is water and so splashing around in um, this little stream that ran you know near the near the, the top paddock of the horse paddock um, and there's this beautiful like rich like red iron clay and rich yellow um, ochre uh, yellow iron I'd say clay and that were exposed and that weren't there when my parents bought the property but which over time got exposed by the water erosion um, and I would be in there playing and I'd come up to the house and I'd be you know covered head to toe in this <laughs> mud um, but at, in high school as well like you know we got to make things out of clay and I, um, one of my, one of my pieces, so I think it was like a, a formative body of work in year oh. 12, <laughs> um, you know, was these beautiful pieces that I made out of red raku clay. And so I've always been drawn to that red clay. Um, and I think that's because that was the color of dirt when I was growing up. Like I had no white clothes as a child and a teenager because, you know, we lived on dam water. Mm. Dam water was full of those same oxides and you know nothing was ever white um and so even you know white shoes stained red <laughs> yeah you no know, but that's that beautiful rich table and soil as well um and so i i was using this red raku clay and i made these really beautiful i'm gonna say they're beautiful i was quite impressed with myself at the time you know as a 17 year old um i just started with a lump of red raku right like two kilo lump of red raku just a block and I just formed these beautiful abstracted um, like grotto type works out of this red raku that 
um, you know, were in themselves like a meditation, I guess, of the landscape. And as a child, as a teenager, you don't realise that you're meditating about the landscape, but you're thinking, you're sitting there and you're making these things and you're thinking about, you know, the places that you interact with regularly. Well, you're remembering the clay. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. So, so it is like this a memory. kind of bodily. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, you know, my first ever memory landscape works. And, um, and I painted them with these like garish acrylic colors because, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I loved it. Yeah, <laughs> I, my, my art teacher had the same response. Yeah. She's like, oh, you made this beautiful organic works. <laughs> and then you covered them with acrylic paint. <laughs> and, but I was like, that's the colors I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, she's like, oh, what about some oxides? <laughs> And this is funny because now this I'm like so all now. about the oxides. <laughs> now you're that teacher. What about the oxides? I know. <laughs> but that's where it comes back to, like all those natural colorants that I really want to use. And as I sort of get less uptight about how I express my ideas, you know, <laughs> well, I'm like, oh, all natural. Don't want to put any fake colors. And I was yeah. like, oh, Rachel, you need to choose the colors that are best communicate your idea and not get uptight about that because let's be honest all you know using underglazes and things like that if they're best able to communicate what i need to communicate about the landscape then i'm going to use them yeah and i'm not going to you know place these unnecessary sort of restrictions on myself about how best to tell the story but yeah, so I'm coming full circle. I'm not. I won't be painting things with acrylic, and I see it now. Like I see some kids get the spray cans out and just absolutely cover these beautiful sculptures in spray paint. And I was like, part of me's like, oh god, what are you doing? <laughs> and then the other part of me's like, oh, remember when you covered your sculpture in acrylic paint in grade twelve, Rachel? Like that's that's it. <laughs> But I had this lovely opportunity when I was in year 12 where um, Churchy used to run this like arts sort of camp for high school students, right? So you could come from all around <clears throat> the state and it was a week long. You stayed on the boarding, you know, you did all these workshops and it was fantastic. Like I got a, that was my first rat of fund, you know, I got the money to fly down and attend and, you know, and at the time like you know, didn't cost as much as that would cost now. Also very exciting coming from a small regional town. Yeah, to go do absolutely. Like and the good thing was is the lady who was one of the counsellors was also the mother of someone who was a student with me. <clears throat> and so she was very passionate about young people having opportunities. And this is why I also am passionate about that because that was my first opportunity where I got to see that art could be something more than just something that I enjoyed. And so that was my first uh, time on a wheel as well. Ooh. Yeah. So in the old churchy ceramic studios on their wheels, like we got to throw things on the wheel. We made, the teacher had made these enormous, like large, I'm going to say probably a meter tall, like cylinders with like a curved top and just a small narrow opening. Like these kind of like, you know, Judy, Judy Watson's pieces that are in the, the river, more I should know the name of those because I love her work but um like that kind of shape and we got to as a collaborative group like a group of teenagers create these beautiful collaborative works where we carved out like covered them in beautiful sort of um underglazes and then carved out it was just it was amazing and I think to myself why aren't people doing things like that now why that's aren't they yeah <laughs> But that's because, and I mean, to an extent, Goma does do that with their, their young artists program, with the creative gens and the edge, all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, it was just such an amazing time because you got to talk to other young people and do that. And I think that's important in developing that sense of possibility. Mm. There used to be yeah. a lot more opportunities for schools and artists to come together, I think, mm. too. Like... I remember there used to be a grant for called like artists in schools. You could do mm. a residency in a school as an artist. And I think that's only just dropped off in the last five years. The last five yeah. years, yeah. And it's just I think especially coming from but I think, a background where art isn't. Yeah. And I think that speaks to a greater decline in the value of the arts 
in society as well. And this is why I get really cranky when I see all this nonsense on social media where, you know, they talk about the money that's just been um, raised. Oh, what was the latest controversy about something? Someone, a gallery spending money or someone was arcing up about the money um, raised by Art Gallery in New South Wales from the Archibald and things like that. And I was like, but that's where the basis of their funding comes from. Like the arts have been so defunded under the Liberal government that, and, and that same sort of decline in, in rhetoric around the value of arts, despite the role that it played during the pandemic. Mm. Like every single person in our society benefited from the arts during COVID, except for artists. Right. People went home and they watched TV. They binged TV. Those are arts workers. People went home and were like, oh, I'm going to take up clay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's arts workers providing them with those opportunities. But the lack of respect, I think, mm. and I think that has got to change because, you know, the work that we do, the, the, the role that art plays in society, I think, needs to remain. Like, that's what defines society, doesn't it? That's what defines, like, creates civilization. essentially. You take away all of those arts and what have you got? Robots. <laughs> so, you know, really, when yeah. you think about it, yeah. um, you know, even people like motorcyclists and car enthusiasts, like, those are artists designing those objects that you enjoy. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You're so right. You, you're quite political, but... I am. <laughs> I, I, no, I just like seeing things you yeah. share and stuff, but that kind of doesn't come into your yeah. art. So can you talk about... Uh, Why my art isn't political? Oh, no, <laughs> just kind of what you express, mm. really. Because look, like your recent ceramic works. Yeah. Can you tell <laughs> us a little bit about them? Um, <laughs> so I guess the thing, what that comes back to, right, is my work is deeply personal. Yeah. And because I guess I get have these two halves of my life, right? I have my professional life, um, which when you're a teacher and anyone who's a teacher who understand who's listening will understand this. Like it takes up a huge chunk of your life. Like you are giving a significant amount of your, you know, capacity as a person to being passionate about that. And that's when you are passionate about that. Um, you know, some people view it as a job and they're more entitled to do that. And they, you know... But when you are passionate about it because you got into something for a purpose, there leaves very limited part of what you've got left to give as a person. And so I guess the, the childhood that I had, the experiences that I had and the connection to the landscape are so much a part of that other part of me that that's what I want to communicate about. Mm. Like I don't want... There is an element of my work, some of my works that are quite political... Um, but it's in a nuanced kind of way. Mm. You know, so when I talk about memory in the landscape and the way that landscapes hold the imprint of traumatic events or silenced histories, and there is that aspect of, of um, you know, political agenda. But my point in making work is to, I guess, heal myself through presenting artworks that also speak to other people who've had similar experiences. And so when I, you know, focus on landscape and the memory, I focus on a variety of things. But I want to create beautiful work that helps me to, I guess, heal the trauma. Mm. Does that make sense? Because yeah. a landscape for me was the landscape for me the role that it played in my life was an escape. You know, I felt safe in nature. I felt safe in the environment. I felt safe spending time on my own in those landscapes. And so they hold that special place for me. And I think that's where I really developed my connection to the landscape and to understanding and I guess feeling the essence of the environment because, you know, we are animals. <laughs> like we are connected to that environment. And I see a real, you can tell when people don't respect the landscape by the way that they treat it and interact with it, right? And I don't want that for my life. Like, that's not me. And so because I understand 
the role that it plays in keeping me happy and healthy. Mm. Mm. It's interesting, like, seeing that come out in your work, like, that you've always, obviously, with your colour palette mm. and the materials you use, have had such a strong connection yeah. to landscape. But your work's... Well, I've known you mm. just over 12 months, but I can mm. see that they're becoming more and more tactile and three-dimensional. Yeah. Like with your water etching. Yeah. And now with your like three-dimensional kind like of being like cross glazes. stations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. It's really interesting. And I think I like having that balance of formalist type pieces with the more sort of abstracted works because I guess that's the two parts to to me right there's those firm solid um, memories but there's also the way that the landscape kind of holds a vagueness to a memory as well and so when I'm working and planning works um, I don't really ever sketch anything like I do it for uni because I have to um, <laughs> and sometimes when I'm planning an exhibition like I'll get I'll go all right I want to have you know a, a, a pair of pieces and I want them to be about this memory and I'll just kind of sketch the general shape mm. but my practice is so intuitive because it's like as I'm working because I'm working about memory and a landscape I'm I'm constructing and the process is about creating as I'm remembering. And so in that sense, my works are, this is going to sound so corny, but my works are the therapy, aren't they? Mm. Because I'm processing the memory as I'm creating a work around that landscape in which that occurred. Mm. And like experiencing the material as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so each aspect of the work touches my hands and as it's touching my hands, I'm sort of, you know like imbuing that work with that memory mm-hmm. and the the aesthetic choices i make about how i construct that are based on how i feel about that work and so the more the more refined pieces so the porcelain etched works with the limited color palette um those tend to be about more difficult memories for me um and so the complexity of the medium um, the, the more strict choices I make about the aesthetic are because I want to get I want to get it right mm. um, so there's a little bit sort of conceptual process driven component to the way that I create in that sense um, but also sometimes I just I'll be making something and then the memory occurs as I'm making and that work will morph as it goes and often often memories just come to me when I'm driving around and I was like you know like there was one time I, the studio where I learned to throw I was driving past and I saw all this lantana on the side of the road and you know I went home and this is when I was working on my you know my 2022 solos and I made a work that afternoon because it reminded me so strongly of something that had occurred and a memory that I had um that I had to make it at that time and that's I guess that's the fragility of memory, isn't it? Especially when there's been a trauma response involved, is that often I don't remember a lot of the things that my older sister very easily remembers. And so it's about as I make works and as I work through the process of unpacking, you know, my relationship with the landscape, um, more memories are, are evolving and, and that yeah. I guess is evolving in that sense as well. Mm-hmm. But just because my works are about particular memories doesn't mean that like when people come in and see those works that they are taken to that memory like the the triptych piece that i had in our terrain exhibition at the start of year like that that was based on a memory like a happy joyous memory that i had of this particular um location and that and that time and even though that was um that was you know a glimpse into sort of you know a, a moment in time you know when you look at that you don't go oh you know that was <laughs> like they're still aesthetically pleasing works um and that's i guess the balance that i have there mm. i feel like yeah i'm just thinking now like looking at the because you you trim really hard angles in, into some of your works 
Yeah. Which is interesting because your work is quite organic mostly mm. until you see those hard angles. But now I'm thinking about the work and thinking about those steps that mm. you've trimmed in and it's making me think about erosion. Is yeah. is that kind of where that comes from? And that's too? what I lo- to an extent, yes. Um And that's where I really found that the water erosion, water etching technique was really valuable in that sense as well. Um, But I I like to also balance. So my my theoretical understanding of of ceramics as a a medium also comes into play. So when I'm going, you know, that step, that hard edge, um, those angles balance the curves and the forms. Like that's about me aesthetically understanding, you know, principles of, of what makes a form work. Mm. Do you feel like you reference the history of ceramics in your work? A little bit, yes. And so I've been thinking a lot more about that as I go in terms of the forms that I choose. And I've I've got an idea I've been cogitating on for the last cogitating. week. Cogitating? I know, isn't that a fun word? Wow. Um... <laughs> <laughs> um on about sort of the the tradition of form and I think that's what I really liked about is it Glenn Barkley that wrote that ceramic forms book that's just yeah. come out that yeah. I love that book I know it's amazing love it <laughs> um I really like looking at that in the way that he examines sort of key moments in the history and tradition of ceramic form and I think that's something I'd like to have a look at a little bit more and explore a little bit more because there's this really interesting moment we're having, um, I think, in society and art where we're examining influence um, as artists. And I think there's an interesting dynamic between tradition and concept and the role that a form plays in that. Mm. So as ceramic artists, the form is sometimes the surface Mm. for the artwork. You know, that's not to say it's not a part of the artwork. Um, But, you know, we as artists make choices about the form that we think will best communicate the concept or the idea. And so if that's the intention... um, you know, how, is that any different from an artist choosing a canvas, mm. choosing to frame their canvas? You know, when does a form become cultural property? Mm, interesting. Yeah. Um, so you, you're working towards something right now. Yes. Yes. How do you how do you start? How do I start? Basically, start? so essentially a body of work. Yeah. How are you gonna How are you gonna begin that? Um, what, what do you do? Do you write down conceptual ideas first or do you start with an idea of form and maybe a visual kind of idea mm-hmm. of what you want your body of work to be about? So I think, and this probably speaks to my background as a teacher, right? So I've always taught it's, it's good to start with an idea or a concept and then you experiment with that and it evolves as you make. And so often, you know, I'll, I'll be, know the general kind of idea for what I want to work on. And I go, all right, I'll just start making pieces. And I think experimentation is really underrated in the arts, especially with... Oh, this is probably going to be controversial. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> the advent of hobbyists <laughs> yeah. wanting to ha- make side hustles, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, do whatever makes you happy. Do whatever pays the bills. Like, whatever. But experimentation is so important. And I think Shannon and Sarah talked about this a lot as well. Like, I, it's an undervalued. And I teach this in my classrooms. Like, I'm like, your first idea is not necessarily your best idea. Your first iteration of a work is not necessarily going to be the best iteration. You know, and I think Shannon talks about this beautifully as well. Like, you might add things and it might take 10 years for that work to be finished until it's finally at that stage. And I don't think she talks about 10 years, but you know, you work on something until it is the right thing. Mm. So I think, um, people have seen maybe 10% of the work that I make. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, there is so <laughs> there is so much work in my house <laughs> and some of it goes in the bin <laughs> and some of it goes to people. But that's because I'm like, oh, that was an experiment. You know, I don't want to put random stuff out into the universe. Like it's, you know, when I'm working on an idea, you're getting, you know, mostly 80% the best of that idea. Sometimes you're putting in the subpar pieces that are good enough Mm. because not everything is a masterpiece, right? Mm. Some of them is about creating and crafting the aesthetic of what the exhibition is. Yeah, yeah. And so I'll generally have like a a concept that I want to work on, um, a general kind of vibe for <laughs> a vibe check <laughs> <laughs> for a very Gen Z <laughs> um, term for that. But like, yeah, there's a there's an idea, there's a memory, there's a kind of a, a, a palette of memories. That's a nice palette metaphor. Of memories. Yeah, a palette of memories. Wow, wow, wow. Um, there's a palette of memories that I want to explore in a work. There's something that I want people to come away from. And then I make my choices around that. Mm. And so, you know, for my upcoming thing, um, you know, already in my mind, I know that I want to have a series of five of the same size, different colours. You know, and whether that's different clays or different glazes or combinations of whatever, like that's what I want. And I love working in odds. And the only time I will work in even numbers is when I want to do a pair mm. and that's the only time so it's a pair or it's an odd number oh. <laughs> yeah <Bye>. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know because again aesthetically it doesn't fit the vibe check <laughs> yeah <laughs> like aesthetically it's you know things in nature are never single or standalone are they mm. and so there's always more than and I'll very rarely make a single piece that's just a you know like my 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 pieces for um and even the the standalone piece that i did have in terrain like initially that was part of a series a group of five and that was the only piece i was willing not willing to part with so um you know again my house is full of things i'm not ready to part with yet (laughs) Um, but i think that speaks to the the deeply personal subject matter of my work um it's nice to live with your work for a while. I and, agree. And yeah. I think that's actually really good for your practice. Yes. It's something I need to do more. And that's what I do a lot. And even yeah. when I was like weaving and, you know, I still I still weave. Like I've still got an idea. There's still textiles in my practice. And my sculptural work sits alongside my textiles a lot more. Um, There's a lot of harmony between those works as well. Even mm, seeing some of your paintings. Yeah. Too. Like they, everything sits together mm. so well. Like, yeah, no mismatch. You know, like your whole house, even the clothes you wear, it's like, honestly, you're like yeah. such a vibe. <laughs> <laughs> and all the Gen Zers are like, oh, look at that Gen X uh, years ago. <laughs> anyway, I spent too much time with teenagers. I think this is my problem. But, um, but yeah, that's how I work. And so I always try to make more than I need. And that in itself is a privilege, right? Like mm-hmm. having the time and the materials and the capital yeah. to be able to do that. Um, and I think that's why I can be selective about what I put out into the world because I'm not needing to, I guess, live off my artistic practice. I think for me, you know, there are things I want to say about the world and I want to say them through my art. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone has to have access to that. Mm. And that's why I think it, my exhibition work is so personal. But, yeah, if that makes... I don't know. Yeah, it does. That makes sense. It does. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to ask you. Mm. Um, so, obviously, teaching art to high schoolers. Mm. Um, what, how, do, how does the interaction with clay kind of compare to other materials do you do you see anyone kind of just initially really really instinctive with the material um does it bring out maybe a bit more rowdiness with the (laughs) youths or um i've actually found like it's it has evolved over time so i've found that 
there's kind of a dual response in the last sort of five to ten years, right? Is that the less time young people spend outside, the less sort of, um, uh, I don't know, like it's a diverse response. It's like, it's a sort of, you know, black and white. They either are like really into it and really keen for it and have this really, you know, take to it, like, you know, duck to water. Or they're like, I don't want to touch that. That's disgusting. Mm -hmm. And I can like, well, when was the last time you played in the dirt? <laughs> but I think it's about sort of... this nice refined white clay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh, that feels gross. <laughs> and so the first time I introduce kids to clay, I'm like, I give them a small blob. And I'm like, I make them do like a five senses evaluation of the material. I'm like, what does it smell like? What does it feel like? You know, what, how does it, you know, what's the... Uh, we don't taste it. That's the only thing. There's no WHS um, uh, <laughs> exception for that. But um, yeah, and so I want to, them to interact with it as a material. And I think it's just about having an approach with them that lets them know like, yeah, like I know you all want to paint and draw and do all that stuff, but actually like it's, this is really, really fun. Mm. And, you know, like, I love it so I want them to love it so it's about the conversations and the narrative that you present about a material and so if you have conversations about the conceptual capacity um, of clay like you can just as easily you know convey something on a pot or with a pot mm -hmm. as you can with a canvas and if you start those conversations early then you're building that culture of possibility mm. because Skills are so important in ceramics, like learning skills that you have to, as a teacher, craft opportunities for kids to marry the two. Because, you know, we are driven by curriculum bodies and, you know, all those, those political, <laughs> um, political agendas that are about what we do. But um, any material presents the possibility to communicate what you want it to communicate. And where you give kids the possibility is where you present them with opportunities to develop the skills that they need. So when they get to those sort of senior years and even onto and into university, they go, oh, I've got this idea. Yeah, I could do that with clay because I know how to, you know, coil build a pot so it doesn't fall and slump. I know how to let things sit for a while. My teacher taught me how to, you know, use a serrated rib and, you know, make sure that my pot was strong. You know, I've been taught how to use a paddle to like even out and stiffen up the walls. Um, and I think that's something that's in some instances missing um, in secondary education. I think for a little while, despite the sort of ceramics renaissance at the moment, um, there's a gap in teacher education because of the removal and the um, of ceramic studios and universities mm. <laughs> especially um uh arts universities in quotation marks and i think that's doing a real disservice and again that speaks to the greater political um climate for the arts but i think people are just when you don't when you haven't been taught that as a as a as a teenager and you go into university and again you you get a tiny little taster like it's about confidence and unless you've got people working in your faculties or working with you or around you accessing you know mentoring you don't develop that confidence yeah it's kind of sad that as as those you know potential to study ceramics mm. at university kind of gets less and less and less mm. there's going to be so many less teachers teaching yeah. it and but i think that also speaks to um the complexity around OHS in schools as well. Mm. Um, you know, we're in this kind of um, political climate where, you know, we're not trusting the, um, I guess, so the very, knowledge of teachers. Very risk adverse. Yeah, and that's that's what I'm like, looking for. Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to like really, really. <laughs> <laughs> and also the economic rationalism yeah. like running a kiln mm. 
you know, running wheels, all that stuff costs mm. money. It's much like, dearer. Uh, but, it, mm. like, the lack of understanding. Like, you can't just throw a greenware piece in a glaze fire. Yeah. You know, unless you've been told that or know that, like, how are you supposed to... You know, there's a lot of tightly held knowledge that unless you're actually engaging in that kind of learning... But also, you know, because teachers are so time poor, like, who's got time yeah. and money to go out and, you know... and the arts funding in in society is reflecting the arts funding that is in education settings so yeah Rachel is there any ceramic artists that students like are drawn to or that you show them that you get good responses mm, that's a really good that question good. <laughs> <laughs> um oh look even when I'm teaching ceramics I'm not always showing ceramic artists as inspiration so I always like to look at the Hermansburg potters for Australia and I think sometimes you have to show them like fun stuff like Bonnie Hislop. Yeah. You know, um, I like showing them. Oh, what's his name from London? The guy with the the hair. Um, the guy oh, Grace and Perry. Yes, him. The guy with the hair. <laughs> this They're is crazy. how I remember people, right? Like my memory's not great, <laughs> and I'm like the guy with the hair. <laughs> he's great yeah and we talk about that um but i also show them like john olsen his like later work where he was getting people to make pots and drawing on them and sort of you know i just it's tricky like it is because often we're looking at ceramics within uh a slightly different conceptual framework so there's like a concept there that we're looking at and the skill or the technique is driven by the concept and so it's about all right let's make some works about you know about having a look at you know so a a unit that I I used to teach was um it's called transforming the masters and so we look at the masters of those modern art movements and how transforming their works onto a ceramic surface retains the meaning of the original work right And so in that sense, it's not about how how the work itself, like it's about the choices you make about the the form and the construction, like are you going to carve things out? Are you going to like sculpt into the surface? Are you going to um, like put put a lid on it? Are you going to make it functional, et cetera? And how does that fit in with the the meaning of the of the original work and so because ceramics has a finite kind of capacity in that setting because of the process involved we don't really have an opportunity in those kind of junior years and I mean some people do and some people don't I don't know maybe that's just the way I craft these learning opportunities like I do show them ceramic artists and we do look at ceramic works but I wouldn't say that there's like standout artists that I select for them to look at because it's very much about the individual sort of student and what they're working on. And maybe when they get into those higher grades, like those senior and when they're working on general and you're, you know, they're doing their own conceptual ideas and that's when you would like go into sort of niche. What are you looking at? What are you, what are you trying to achieve? I know of a couple of artists, blah, blah, blah. Um, But what I find really interesting is, you know, the importance of them understanding functional work as a sort of career path. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I, you know, myself and another art teacher, when we were writing um, a senior program in applied arts, we made sure that we did like a whole semester, like six months on functional ceramics. And so in that... They were looking at different clays and different sort of glaze combinations. And then they did this whole sort of like eight weeks of experimentation, which in a school is a luxury, um, <laughs> where you just, you just, you know, fluffed around and found out, right? Like you, you know, give them a, you know, sh- get them to do a bit of marbling and see what that looks like and how that behaves. Yeah, I know. You know, it's a bit of the applied subjects though, isn't it? Yeah. You've got a lot more scope to. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, you've got a different sort of audience sometimes like um and I found that kids really from kids from non-western cultural backgrounds tend to really get into it a lot more 
But yeah, and I find that because there is this sort of like intergenerational working with your hands, um, they take to it. And so kids that were really struggling with, you know, 2D expression found clay, like just that's the ability, it's the fine motor skills of working with your hands. Cool. Mm. That's so cool. That answer oh, like honestly, just... it just sounds like the ceramics that you do with the kids. I, I cannot imagine. <laughs> that yeah. sounds amazing just know. to be in high school and have that opportunity to work with clay in that way. Sometimes I'd like to, you know, sometimes I wonder whether the Education Queensland might like to set up a school of the arts and... You know, there's a couple. Pick me. <laughs> there's a couple in America, right? And this is really interesting. There's a couple of schools in America, and I can't remember what their names are right now because this is, you know, three, four year old knowledge um, that are teaching every single subject matter through the arts because of the p- capacity for creativity to actually enhance understanding and knowledge. And yeah. yeah. But it's like maths through drawing. Ooh. Well, I need all the help I can get retaining math, so... <laughs> You'd be surprised. Like, I did maths B when I was in high school, right? Which is the middle the middle maths. And I was like, I'm never going to use this. Number of times I've used it as an artist. And this is the thing, right? Like, ceramics, ceramics, there's so ceramics, much. And also, textiles, um, like... If you have to, like, if you're doing any exhibition installing, mm, yeah. so much spatial maths. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And this is the thing, and that's why kids like, oh, I hate maths, and I teach maths. I'm like, let's go, let's go the dimensions, like let's work out what the most aesthetically pleasing or the maximum size this can be, with the scope for what we've had. And I, yeah. you know, you know, but I guess that's, I don't know, that's old school education that's in a teaching. sense. Thanks. That is yeah. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Um. Well, Rachel, mm. we'd like to know. Mm. Do you have any advice for early career? artists or early career ceramicists um i think the best thing you can do is take the time to experiment um and be really thoughtful about what you put out into the world uh in terms of you know wait till a work is resolved before you put it out there you know if you if you can't articulate what the work is about and how your choices as an artist have shaped that meaning I would say the work's not resolved and not ready for the world Mm. um so and you know that might be that's about sort of developing your identity and I think it's okay to go oh experimentation this is what I'm working on this is what I'm working towards I'm having a play here and I think that's really important as well like giving yourself creative play time Mm. and that's why I tend to like have after I have like big exhibitions I'll go and stay somewhere random in the countryside for a week because I need that time to sort of really think about to decompress and you know replenish my creative reserves (laughs) Yeah, because it can be exhausting as an artist to be constantly feeling like you have to produce and I think it's okay to have two sort of veins to what you're doing I think it's okay to have the stuff that you sell and so that this is what you're working on while you're working towards your other stuff the stuff that I guess feeds your you know creative spirituality yeah and that's i guess why i've also started making like a little bit of functional work on the side because i'd like to sell my conceptual work but not everyone can afford <laughs> like a vase you know that's got like a big idea behind it like yeah and so i think it's important to really think if you're working f- like exhibition conceptually really think about what you consider to be finished and give yourself permission to be experimental give yourself permission to just make stuff to test ideas Mm. before without the pressure of going i have to be putting stuff out there you know i was making stuff for like 10 years before i put anything on instagram wow like there's you know i didn't have an artist instagram until 
2022. Mm-hmm. We will link that in the description. <laughs> like, Check it out. It's but good. that's I feel like this <laughs> yeah. and social media is not what it is in term in, it's not what it used to be. So it used to be this really amazing, especially Instagram platform for artists to connect with an audience, a worldwide audience, and to build that collector culture. Um, but it's not like that anymore. Like it's an oversaturated market full of AI generated rubbish. Mm. And the more of your early work, experimental work that you put out into the world, um, the more that gets, that comes to define, I guess, your aesthetic as an artist. So you've really got to think about what do I want to represent me yeah. and my ideas. Yeah. Or like a really a thoughtful approach. Mm, thoughtful. And I'm not saying, like, and I don't want you to think that you have to gatekeep your creativity, mm. but there's a reason that experimentation is so purposeful. There's a reason that all those super famous masters have books and books and books of sketchbooks of things and paintings and studies. Like, the importance of a study can't be understated. Like, how many times did Da Vinci paint Mona Lisa before he painted Mona Lisa? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> we'll never know. Because it's yeah. like, you yeah. know, yeah. renaissance. <laughs> yeah. um, and those things are lost. But <sighs> practice doing things before... You... And sometimes your experiment will be the thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. But without experimentation you don't you're not refining your skill and your technique and i think that that might be something that's a little bit lost that's really good good advice yeah, yeah. skill and technique is foundational to creating good work mm. we can't all be warhol getting his friends to wee on a painting <laughs> like <laughs> you know he would never have gotten away with that if that's what he did first yeah true. yeah that's so true so Keep your like cool conceptual stuff to bring out of the closet when <laughs> when you've got a bit of a bit of a an understanding that yeah. I just yeah. think creative play, experimentation is critical and learn. Like I you know, glaze making is something that I really want to get into, but there is so much I do not know that I'm not prepared yet to even you know I'm still learning. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not gonna put anything out there that I've made. <laughs> with my glazes <laughs> until I'm happy that though that I can talk about them with some kind of authority yeah. and factual basis. Yeah. Mm. And that's the thing. It's like, you know, opinions are not facts. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think research and, and by that extension, experimentation is a form of practical research. Yeah. It's severely underrated. Yeah. yeah. In contemporary arts. That's what I found interesting in, in honours was really documenting practice-led research mm. and kind of really understanding what that was and the yeah. value it brings into your work as well yeah. um yeah <laughs> well we really look forward to this big mysterious project <laughs> you're working on um yeah that's that'll be great that's all right Thanks yeah having me everybody um check out rachel on the on the socials mm-hmm. she's got great work great teacher Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming. No worries. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Jane. (laughs) Thanks, Laura. (laughs) Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to this episode. We hope you enjoyed. You can find us on Instagram at birdsofclay underscore podcast. Please feel free to send us any questions or comments. And if you could leave us a review on whatever platform you're listening on, that would be amazing. We'll see you next time.